Now, this 14th talk of mine is about a filmmaker called Hans Jürgen Seiderberg. In these talks, I always try and find figures who are alive and amongst us now who are in this most difficult of eras, this most liberal, most democratic, most egalitarian of eras. Now, Seiderberg wanted to go back to many of the great actors and actresses who were then nearing the ends of their lives in the 60s and put them on the screen for the last time, a sort of addendum, a memorial. He dealt with uh, Fritz Kortner, who was a very well-known actor, particularly of Shakespearean drama in Germany. He's very elderly then. His great performance in German theatre was the Shylock. And Cyberberg has him, possibly in his last ever performance. And Kortner's an old man. He's quite clearly suffering with various illnesses that will take him away a year or two after filming in 66. But he gets him to articulate this superhuman, inhuman scream of revenge, Shylock's desire for revenge against the Gentile world. World, a sort of primal scream. Remember in the 60s there was that cult called Primal Scream? Nevertheless, Connor gets this scream in this film. And then it ends. He did another famous documentary of Cosimo Wagner, which caused enormous problems for the Bayreuth Festival and enormous problems for her family because he kept the microphone on after the interviews had left. And she talks and she talks and she talks. And then after a certain gap, she starts talking about Adolf Hitler. And she talked about Adolf Hitler for four hours and quite a lot of this found this into what would then be the final cut of the film and the family went berserk when this film was distributed and Cyberberg was never allowed to attend the festival again. It was a scandal to a degree although the scandal was slightly undercut by the fact that he was regarded as a revealer of everything, of something that had been widely known anyway. In other words, that she was extremely sympathetic but also that he, Hitler had once told her that Wagnerism was his religion or the nearest that he ever came to one. Now, Cyberberg is most famous for a film called Hitler, Ein Film aus Deutschland, made in 1978, which lasts seven and a quarter hours. Hitler cost £100,000 to make. The thing about this film is it is quite visually extraordinary because it's based in one set. And for a long time, it was treated as essentially an avant-garde and a modernistic film because it's not narrative-based, it's episodic, it's slightly mannerist, it superficially appears to be very anti, whereas its real crime is neutrality about matters that you can't be neutral about, not in the contemporary postmodern Federal Republic. The first section deals with Hitler's personality cult. All sorts of scenes, some taken from circus and vaudeville, some drawing on Weimar culture, use of dolls, use of sets that are lit in red, use of a lot of sort of occultistic, fuller, gothic imagery to create a sort of sensibility which has been completely voided in the post-war dispensation. The second section deals with Volkish Romanticism in the 19th century. Also has a significant filmic history of German 19th century art added into the general mixture. The third section deals with the Shoah, particularly as it's seen from Himmler's perspective, for which there is no apology. And this is the interesting thing about it, that it's dealt with in a tone that's almost identical to the way um, Menachem Begin describes the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. When asked about these events, Begin said, we did what we had to. Let there not be talk of morality. There is only the necessity of action and vigour. And that's the sort of attitude that you get in that third section. I think a few worrying bells went off when that section was seen. But because it's not in any sense revisionist, it's again the, the view that you get subliminally from that section is that if Germany is to ever have a future, it has to master his view of the consequences of these events. In some ways, he's preaching what Nietzsche called self-overcoming, whereby you say yes to life, you accept even the most unpleasant things. You absorb them just as you absorb rubbish and trash in a fire. You step over it to other things and to other glories. It's the refusal to be imprisoned by the consequences of the destructive urge seen as part of the human potentiality. In other words, it's a non-dualist view of morals, an explicitly non-Christian viewpoint, but not belated as such. The fourth section deals with the aftermath and the generation who fills it with incredible acuteness because Cyberberg's generation mentally comes of age in the immediate aftermath of these events. He talks about the legacy of what it means to be German in the modern world. And of course, most contemporary Germans want to make money. They want to get away from as much of that as possible. They want to redefine the nature of who and what they are. They don't even want to discuss it. Cyberberg's, in a sense, going straight for that heart of darkness. He's going straight there without equivocation because he knows that if you don't in a sense bring this material to the surface 
morally truthful creativity is impossible. Cyberbergs in love, not with a particular government between 33 and 45, but with the aesthetics from which it originated. And he wants to go to those areas that contemporary Germany has cast as off limits. The dilemma that Cyberberg has is he's not a politician, he's not a political partisan. He's a partisan for German culture. And therefore his perspective is you cannot have German artistic culture with this Voltaic energy, this storm sense of this sort of condenser battery removed from the circuit. You have to have that primary material, fuel, upon which to feed. And if you can't have it because it's denied you in a particular era, then you can't express nationally what you are. Now, the film had a reasonable success and was shown in art cinemas all over the world. Susan Sontag wrote extensively about it. She wrote an essay called Fascinating Fascism, which is largely based on that film. It seemed reasonably successful, far too artistic and obscure for many people. Now, after about 1990, he found it increasingly difficult, certainly in the Federal Republic, to raise money to make films, because he wrote a book in 1990 called The Fortunes and Misfortunes of Artists in Germany after the Second War. This created an enormous cultural war, as they're called, into Germany at the time. Many people who were associated with Cyberberg until then dropped him after that, and he became a little bit of an unperson. person. During this book, he says that Germany is um, essentially culturally rotten and has destroyed itself and is self-hating, and ironically, in relation to everything connected with the past, is uh, philo-Semitic, excessively so. And this is not really it for him, I think. Now, Cyberberg's politics is less in important than the spirituality of the artistry that he represents. He's positioned himself to be the repository of the romantic Volkish sensibility, which people know is quintessentially German, and yet is ideologically denied in contemporary Germany. What's wanted are endless novels of guilt and expiation and anti-romanticism and existentialism and writers like Robert Balson. Elias Canetti is also defy in this sort of thing, you know. We've destroyed ourselves and we've deserved it. This sort of stuff, endlessly, this is what's wanted, needed, required, um, expiation before the possibility of a primary statement. It's the sort of Angela Merkel sort of, um, never be proud to say that you're German without an enormous preliminary screed that almost has to be read out of apologetic before you can even get to the moment that you enunciate in a quiet voice. The truth is you can't create anything in a culture without that element of fire in the belly and without that element of prior authentication. After German unification, there were quite a few articles about Cyberberg. There was one well-known one by Dadarich and, and Kamecki called Spiritual Reactionaries and Their Attitude Towards the New German Unification. Many people, of course, saw a great danger in the nationalisms, petty and confused, although some of them were, that were released when communism was taken off. And there was lots of ink spilled in allegedly quality journals all over the world about the dangers of this and that. So Cyberberg had his moment in his book in 1990. It's also very important to consider his class position in a strange sort of way in post-war Germany. That type of class background destroyed several times over, really. Destroyed by the collapse of the Second Empire, finished off by the First War, any savings pretty much decimated by the inflation. The Weimar period was a sort of an interregnum that he just got through. Then there was a quasi-authoritarian semi-militarist government between 30 and 33, then Hitler's chancellorship thereafter, then the German world seemed to have come to an end, with every city and every town in complete steaming rubble, tens of thousands of corpses under the rubble. And this is before you could rebuild, in accordance with what will be later called the German economic miracle, that which had been destroyed before. Everything is a sort of simulacrum, a version, a film a virtual version, a virtual reality version of what existed. And that's why he sees everything as a film, as Susan Sontag worked out long after she wrote her essay, Fascinating Fascism, is that maybe he regards the show as a film. A film. A film from Germany. Which, if you like, of course, a film's a fiction, but it can be truer than fact, mm. and more important than fact. Like a great religion is more important than fact, because it can move millions of human beings to behave in ways they would never do otherwise. So, when you look at the artistic basis and the methodological premises of his cultural practice, as contemporary Marxist cultural studies types would call it, you suddenly see that there's something actually slightly insidious to liberal order. But my view is it's less 
conscious than semi-conscious, in my opinion, of his work, because he's somebody whose total focus is artistic. In a very German way, he's totalitarian about art. It's that desire to actually go to the limit of what is possible to say in a given trajectory. And there's also a yearning idealism, which exists in many cultures, but I often quintessentially associate with Germanic forms of art and with the German sensibility, without which north, south, east or west, there can't really be a centre. It's not that we're all Germans, really, although English people are primarily Germanic, but nevertheless... It's that they're the core to the European identity, which can have many outer chambers, but without the core, doesn't exist. And this is why, the, despite the fact that we technically fought against them savagely 12 times in the, second, in the 20th century, that is actually less important in my view, than the spiritual damage which has been done to Germany since the Second World War. And the degradation of Germany and of things German in casual British Parliament, and much and American as well, and much more subtly and culturally at every level, from the mass cultural levels and sort of graphic novels to um, modernist opera and back again. Every level there has been this sort of attitude of not just cynicism or disrespect, but deconstruction and willed and vigorous and sort of emotionally uh, violent deconstruction of that. And unless contemporary European people can, in the next uh, years that face us, step over that, there will be a hole right in the heart of the European identity. Because our identity without German culture is essentially unthinkable. Without its art, without its literature, without its music, without its philosophy, without its, at times, to the English spirit, ponderous seriousness, without its fanatical attitude towards ideas, that streak of virulence that's part of the Germanic nature, and in which now they've been taught to be afraid. And Cyberberg's work is an artistic attempt to wrestle with what it is to be German, which, if you think about it, there's no nationality in Europe, even in Russia under communism, that is more difficult to do or to bring off or even to deal with than the German identity. And Cyberberg is not a right wing, in my view. Either. He's a conservative nationalist of a mild sort, but he's an aesthetic German. And his real premise is that Germany is in all of us. And without its cultural inheritance as something to use and step beyond, we cannot have a coherent Europeanness. And without that trajectory, it is not possible to survive. So I would ask you, next time you've got an hour or so on the internet, to put Hans Jürgen Cyberberg into Google or one of the other search engines, and bring up what you can and see what you make of it. Because he's somebody who is obscure, but he's obscure not because he's no good, but because he's slightly dangerous. And in this era of standardization and of dumbing down and of conformity, there is a great need for those who are prepared to stand up for the inner lives of their own peoples. Thank you very much.